Hey guys, what's up? This is Chad Haig here in Southern India. I'd like to start a series of videos on the philosophy of Julius Evola. This uh, series will cover the revolt against the modern world. Now, since this is a long book, I'll have to break this up into four videos. Uh, the first video today, we'll talk about part one, World of Tradition. Uh, this will be chapters one through ten. But of course, any series on Evola has to begin by acknowledging the elephant in the room and uh, asking you, the viewer, this question. Do you have the guts to venture? into the supremely forbidden territory of discussing one of the most controversial thinkers of the 20th century. In this series of videos, we will break the silence in academic censorship to analyze what is, whether you agree with it or not, an extremely interesting book. Now, of course, the professional uh, thinkers within the, uh, the media and the academic industry, um, on the occasion they do talk about Evola at all, will um, circulate these caricatures and stereotypical sound bites, which are really just meant to dissuade anybody from wanting to read this book. And that is why we have a duty, despite the controversial uh, nature of, of this book, to talk about it at a serious level, which almost nobody within the class of professional thinkers is doing. So, we do have to begin with the disclaimer, however, that this video is for educational purposes alone. The purpose of this video is not to promote Evola's theories as true, nor is it to refute them, however, as false. The decision whether to believe them is solely up to the viewer. I acknowledge, in addition, that Evola is a very controversial figure, but I don't support banning or censoring his works for that reason alone. So let's talk about what these forbidden ideas actually are. Uh, the most important in a set of uh, fundamental oppositions which make up the context of this book is the difference between tradition and progress. Now by tradition, Evola meant like the world of tradition as this type of foundation of, 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 of the social order and of the, uh, the body of knowledge and the spiritual life that had um, played an important role for thousands of years, but um, has been uh, degenerated and abandoned in recent times in the name of progress. But of course, for him, progress doesn't really mean that. It's more like a decline from the ideal that you had in the world of tradition. And of course, this means that modern political notions like democracy are also not... Um, what they appear to be. Now, of course, we have euphemisms to talk about democracy. We say things like, well, it just means that everybody has equal access to succeed in life, even though that's not the case. But what democracy really means as uh, uh, Finnish fisherman Penty Linkola, another Orwellian thought criminal, had the guts to say is it's really just the idea that we're all the same. And for Linkel, excuse me, for Evola, it's really the loss of the ideal of form that you had in the world of tradition. So democracy is really just the reduction of the social body to the formless and indeterminate mass. And that is something of a deterioration away from the ideal that you find embodied within things like traditional hierarchy, as controversial as that might be. Of course, you can only talk about something like um, uh, the primacy of form if you have something like absolutes, which will negate the intellectual dogma of relativism that you have today, which is itself based on materialism. So today, the intellectual doctrine is that nothing exists except physical material stuff. And because there are no um, intellectual absolutes, especially no spiritual absolutes, everything's relative. That, however, is a new idea and another sign of degeneration. In the world of tradition, you have these spiritual absolutes. You have symbols across cultures, for example, for the same sort of spiritual absolutes, as we'll talk about in this video. And it's this that is really the thought crime in the book. I would argue that more controversial than challenging democracy, more controversial than challenging progress, is the idea that beyond the realm of the physical, you have these spiritual absolutes. That's really the reason why Evola is not more widely read by the professional thinkers. So this, of course, entails a very different view of the vastly distant past. Was prehistoric era really the time of cavemen? Or is this something of a myth that fits in with the idea of progress. Far from being a primitive, barbaric age 
of uh, the vastly distant past, he claims was actually a primordial golden age. That's where you had the ideals he just mentioned actually upheld. And we've actually declined so much uh, that now what he calls uh, are living in the dark age. So let's go ahead and talk about the text itself. Part one, the world tradition opens with this idea that you won't really understand any of the rest of the book unless you know about the doctrine of the two natures. This is the idea in the world of tradition of talking about the physical order as being lower than the metaphysical order. Mortal nature, similarly opposed to immortal nature, the inferior realm of mere becoming, lower than the superior realm of being. The visible tangible dimension is lower than the invisible intangible dimension. This was the support, source, and true life of the former, he says. The notion of reality, which was accessible to the world tradition, was actually much broader than the truncated fragment, which we consider today to be the only thing worthy of consideration. But that's because we're working from a crass materialistic viewpoint, which actively forbids talking about um, the, the higher realm of being, etc., as, a, as uh, something which is either outdated <laughs> as superstition or uh, something which um, may blame for all the problems. But even nature himself did not refer to the world of natural science that we know today. Even nature in that context corresponded to an invisible reality. And that is the challenge in understanding what Evola is really talking about. So therefore, in chapter one, in the beginning, you have this distinction between being and becoming, for example. Mere matter was, as, in terms of beca becoming, was largely thought of as just the inability to acquire a perfect form or law, which was inferior to the higher realm of being, which was associated with form. Therefore, you have this path leading up to the realm of being, and that was traditionally the path of the ascetic. This was the path of self-mastery, self-discipline, having a unified life which is already sufficiently complete that it does not need to be made complete through dependency on some other agent. You have a, an echo of this idea in Aristotle. He says um, the philosopher is the happiest because he doesn't require inputs from elsewhere in order to become happy. He can just use his mind and think. And that's kind of an echo of, um, of, of this idea, albeit a kind of distorted one. Nonetheless, contrary to the decadent modern materialist view, a merely physical existence is actually meaningless if it does not include the striving for the higher realm of being. This applies to the political realm in addition to the individual level. In the world of tradition, any authority or institution not oriented upward towards being was considered vain, ephemeral, and lacking in legitimacy. Controversial as such notions might be today, this meant that the world of tradition valued divine kingship, traditional law, the caste system, and the two great ways to approach the transcendent, which were heroic action and contemplation. In comparison, the formless mass society of our era, with its crass materialism and pseudo-intellectual relativism, is celebrated as progress, but it embodies the exact antithesis of what was valued here. Therefore, in the world of tradition, certain beings are understood to have a superiority over the mere human condition. The traditional king was seen as a bridge between the natural and supernatural dimensions. The legitimacy of their political rule was not based, by the way, on modern cliches of brute force. You just force people to obey. Uh, they were rather seen as founded on <clears throat> the credible foundation of their having a transcendent and non-human quality above the temporal and visible dimension, something which was based in a powerful reality. This wasn't just an artificial fiction or a, a hoax built out of a conspiracy either. We would be misled even to search for this principle in things like personal talents. It wasn't just that they had intelligence, charisma, skill, etc. The whole point was that this had a metaphysical rather than a merely physical character. Nor was this understood to be merely allegorical. In ancient Egypt, for example, the pharaoh was supposed to be a real manifestation of Ra or Horus. Although appeals to spirit are overwhelmingly unpopular today, one cannot understand why there was no need to coerce subjects into obedience through brute materialistic force. If one realized that the hermeneutics of spiritual essences 
as I talk about in my upcoming book, uh, Hermeneutics of Ecological Limitation, they were an integral part of the ancient world experience. Therefore, criticism against the very possibility of spiritual hermeneutics on grounds that only physical and material objects are possible to examine tends to miss the role of symbol in spiritual interpretation. It is meaningful to talk about spirit as something to be interpreted if you take into account the role that symbol played in making that accessible. In the world of tradition, for example, kingship was associated with the solar symbol. We must be careful, however, to examine that the symbol was not empty. It rather denoted a metaphysical reality, which eventually came to be seen as a non-human operating force, which the king did not possess in and by himself. Thus, the king also played the role of a priest. In the case of the pharaoh, he performed the daily, role, uh, the daily prayers to renew his divine power. Likewise, we can speak about certain spiritual absolutes which manifest themselves in symbols across various representations and analogical transpositions, but which nonetheless embody a certain unity. For example, we have certain ritual events which vary across cultural contexts, but still manifest the same spiritual idea. Enthronement is one such ritual event, in which the point is the symbolism of the kings becoming one with the god. In the enthroning ritual, you have this symbolism of hierarchy and dependence upon the stability of an unmoved center. That unmoved center is the king's throne. That's where he sits still. This is also related to the Babylonian pyramid, as this is an architectural expression of the same principle of cosmic order. Even Plato's philosopher kings, king is somebody who sits atop the social hierarchy in the Republic, is an echo of this idea. Therefore, contrary to the modern humanistic view, the notion of laws with merely human origin, was totally foreign to the world of tradition. Laws were legitimate only insofar as they had a divine origin grounded in some spiritual and transcendent character. This is why breaking the law was literally a matter of sacrilege and impiety, far from merely fearing earthly punishment from the state. Such a violation was understood to pose a danger for the fate of the person and the people to whom he or she was closely related. Likewise, any appeal to the usefulness or uselessness of the law, that is to say utilitarianism, is a modern preoccupation, which Evola calls the ultimate materialistic criterion of modern society. It is no coincidence, then, that the symbol of the stone recurs in various cultural contexts when this question of the legitimacy of rule comes up. We are familiar with uh, King Arthur pulling the uh, sword from the stone in ancient Britannia, but Theseus in Greece and Sorb in Persia also drew a sword from a stone as a symbol to determine their worthiness of rule. The stone also is portrayed as the stone from above, the stone from the sky, um, to, to communicate this idea. Therefore, under democracy, what we have today, where the state's only recognized principle of legitimacy and authority is in the indeterminate masses, this is something which Evola calls a regression to what was typical of naturalistic social forms lacking a spiritual foundation, which alone can be held through actually participating in the higher order of being. We even miss the point, however, if we think about hierarchy as based on economic values, um, for it has to be spiritual. Therefore, the right was the cement binding together traditional organizations. A right is kind of a weird thing, which is hard to understand in the materialistic, secularized um, uh, society we live in today, because a right was something which left no room for creative subjective expression, because the rights, the norms, I should say, were detailed and strict. And the consequences for neglecting them or allowing an unqualified person to perform the right entailed the risk of unleashing dreadful powers. We can't really understand that today because we tend to view things, either, such things either as outdated pre-scientific superstition or we might consider it merely as an emotional or aesthetic occasion of beauty, but it was neither. There is, this is only due to shrinking the realm of concern down to the narrow space of materialism. But in the traditional worldview, the physical plane was understood to merely contain effects. Nothing takes place in this world unless it originated in the next world or in the invisible dimension. Therefore, he praises the Indo-Aryan civilization as one of the most thorough applications of just these principles. The Brahmin caste was not based on material wealth, nor was it based on physical strength. It was only performing the sacred rites which defined them. In contrast, 
with the importance of being able to claim divine ancestry. He says in ancient Rome you find this type of collectivism, um, which is a characteristic of those with no founding father. And the worship of feminine earth deities is another degeneration from the ideal of tradition. Fire is therefore an important symbol in this context, since the fire emanated from the founding father and had to be kept burning at all times by the family. Therefore, the family was not seen as a merely naturalistic entity. It could only be understood on religious grounds because the real source of the family unit was the hearth and the ancestors. Therefore, there was an emphasis on right rather than on biological blood. For a superior and purely spiritual type of unity had to be found there. However, the spiritual world of tradition was not really what we would call today religion. Okay, uh, Right, for example, was not like the modern notion of religious devotion. It was rather divine technique. It was determining action upon invisible forces in inner states, kind of like what we do today with acting upon physical forces and states of matter. Contrary to expectation, the origin of all of this was not the animistic worship of the earth. That is not the primordial foundation from which all of this originated, but is in itself a sign of decadence. Because for Evola, degeneration is precisely becoming more human. Therefore, Evola's relation to the occult is tricky because when he talks about magic, he doesn't really mean what you would probably assume he does. He says himself, magic designates, above all, a special attitude towards spiritual reality itself. An attitude closely related to the kingly tradition and initiation. Therefore, um, traditional views on the afterlife are also different from the standard um, Christian binary of heaven and hell. In the world of tradition, it was more complicated even than just body-soul. In addition to the physical body, there's three entities. You have the conscious eye of the waking state, then you have the demon or the devil. And by the way, demon in this context does not mean something evil necessarily. Um, then you have what proceeds from the waking eye after death. For most people, this is the shadow, although there are exceptions. So a person who belongs to nature has his or her ultimate foundation in the demon. Once again, this does not mean an evil spirit. The demon is rather the deep force that originally produced consciousness in the finite form of the body. This force remains behind in the individual in pre-conscious dimensions. It remains the foundation of organic processes and subtle relations with the outside, which elude direct perception. This double is also associated with the primordial ancestor or totem, that soul that generated the family, the tribe, etc. Without the demon's generating power, the family would, by the way, go extinct. After death, the ordinary person loses his or her identity, as this was illusory anyway, but the remaining shadow then dissolves back into the totem through the lengthy process of the second death. The exception to this, of course, is the heroes and the demigods. They don't die the second death of the shadow, but instead they achieve the transcendent, self-subsistent, and incorruptible status of the gods. The god is the one who overcomes the second death in this context. You have, therefore, this symbol of height associated with this accomplishment. In uh, the Nordic tradition, it's Valhalla. In the Aztec and Inca traditions, it's the House of the Sun. Therefore, like Spengler, Evola was interested in the question of how and why great civilizations decline. But he concluded that no, natural, no, no naturalistic explanation will ever be sufficient. Instead, one must search for things like the neglect of sacred rights, the violation of traditional laws, and the disregard for caste hierarchy as the real explanations for a society's decline, as controversial as that is to say. In a much more than metaphorical sense, <coughs> excuse me, these undo order and bring back chaos. Now, it's important to note that although Jordan Peterson correctly identifies the interplay of chaos and order as the theme of ancient mythology, for Peterson, this is largely just psychological. Um, we need psychological order to function amidst natural chaos, is Peterson's idea, his interpretation of seeing this at work in ancient mythology. Evola differs in that for him, this is far more than just psychological. The result of losing sacred order will be nothing short of real supernatural catastrophe. Contrary to expectation, by the way, universal peace is not the solution to this. Since the elimination of social tensions might it actually favor the deeper causes of civilizational disintegration. In addition, you can't reduce this to the notion of race as a merely biological or naturalistic notion of blood purity, despite the media's caricature. 
That also misses the point because a great civilization only arises when a supernatural and non-human force of order, higher order, acts upon these factors. Losing contact with the higher power sets in decline, much like David Icke's notion that we're enslaved because we've lost contact with our higher selves. That's kind of an old idea of tradition. At that point, you get individualism, the anonymous masses, and the mechanization of modern technology. Therefore, there was an alteration in tradition when the real idea shifted from uh, the regal idea, shifted from being incarnated in beings who are naturally above human limitations. And it said beings who must develop the quality in themselves. This is the distinction between the god and the hero. The hero is, in a certain sense, the man who became a god but was not born one. There were certain symbolic acts which went along with this future king's path upwards to try to achieve this. They included time in solitary confinement, swimming across the river through blood, swimming by his own strength to leave behind the old body, the old soul, and personality on the bank. This symbolism was, was not merely metaphorical, but meant to establish contact with the supernatural dimension. After the swim, the king would ascend the mountain, also associated with the island in some symbolism. But the climb upwards was, sim was symbolic of a climb to the stars. The stars, of course, were fixed and therefore an idea of fixed being. 